Well, I've got a really interesting day today. I'm actually in the Valleys of Wales, uh, in the Rhondda Valley, at the top end of the Rhondda Valley. And there is, underneath me, a tunnel. Uh, which was built, I don't know, probably 150, whatever it is, years ago. And it, it was actually built to link these valleys with Swansea, which is over there. And there's a big mountain range in the way. So the tunnel actually goes underneath there uh, and it enabled coal to be taken from the Rhondda Valleys to the ports in Swansea. And it was closed, I can't remember how many years ago, um, but they are talking about reopening it uh, as a cycle uh, route. And it would be amazing, because it would mean that you'd be able to cycle from the coast over there in Swansea uh, and all those towns through the tunnel into accessing these areas here where there's the bike park Wales, there's, a, there's the Affan Valley um, bike park, there's the new Zip World. Uh, so it would just for tourism, it'd be amazing. But the thing is, it's underground and I haven't actually confessed, but I'm not the biggest fan of underground spaces. But uh, let's see what it's like. Okay, right guys, have a good one. Okay, Watch your foot in. Steve, don't fall. Yeah. I'll be doing the comms. Oh. Hey, is your leg done? Yeah. Right, take your time, John. Hallelujah. Come on, watch this. Then. It's not going anywhere. That skateboard's going to come out. Andy is going to jump on it. And the boys will pull him through. And then you're going to come. This bit is a bit spooky. There's a skateboard that's going to pull me through this very, very narrow tunnel. Ugh. Right. <laughs> That is the boat though, yeah? Why do you want to have it reopened? Because it's an engineering masterpiece. Um, like I say, when it's open, it will be the second longest walk, cycle path and walkway in the world. The only one longer than this used as a cycling walkway uh, is the Snoqualmie Tunnel in the USA. Really? Yeah. So, and of six months of the year, this will be the longest because of the weather, the Snoqualmie Tunnel is closed. So and that'll be in the Rhondda Valleys? In yeah. the Rhondda Valley, on, on our Welcome front door. <laughs> hey, what? Welcome to the Rhondda Tunnel. <laughs> There's the portal in the Oh, wow, yes. That would have been the entrance. The thing. entrance, yeah. Why are you um, spending so much of your time and energies doing what you're doing on this tunnel? What does it matter to you? Well, I'm a mining engineer anyway, mining and tunnel engineer by trade initially. And then I worked for a fire and rescue service, head of safety. So combined, this is a very interesting project and um, I enjoyed my time in the coal boat so much that any chance I get to go into a tunnel, uh, I grab it straight away. So from your point of view, um, structurally, how is it? Structurally, it's, I would say, it was very, very competent. Um, only about 5% of the tunnel requires repair. Wow. There's very little distortion. There is a fault area about halfway along. You will see very slight distortion, but that's nothing compared to what we used to underground. And it is quite safe, and it can be converted into a cycle and pedestrian track without any fears for safety at all. Really? Wow. Without too much effort? Well, I mean, reasonable amount of effort, but... A reasonable amount of effort and a little bit of cost. How much is it, do you know? We have estimated at around £13 million. Right, but what it would do for the area is extraordinary. It would draw that much money in in a few years, no problems. It would create jobs. It will create a healthier lifestyle for people. It will connect two valleys. So the Avon Valley, which is a rather remote valley, will have access to the Rhondda Valley where there's excellent bus and train services, um, more facilities for people. And it's just a little walk through the tunnel or a ride through. <laughs> Tell me about the Rhondda Tunnel Society then. Um, I started the Rhondda Tunnel Society back in 2014 uh, with 19 uh, attending. And within a year, we had about 3,000 members. Wow, why? Um, I think everybody's in love with the railway. Um, and of course, this tunnel is nearly two miles long. And it's the longest in Europe and the second longest in the world for cycling. 
What's this to do? This is measuring the oxygen level. Right. How, how is the air down here? Cause it's excellent. How come? Because we're in a tunnel. Well, but there is ventilation from the, the shaft at the other end. Right. And air at low water levels comes in through the pipe in the tunnel. So there, there is air circulation. Yes, yeah, there's, there's leakage throughout the tunnel. But if you look down there, the pipe has just come through. The other end of that, there's another pipe, which is a secondary drainage pipe, which goes right out to the stream the other end. So air flows through that, it leaks through the shaft, and it leaks at the other end. So we've got a... I, ironically, it doesn't smell damp. No. <laughs> I've been in houses that smell more damp. Yeah. This is uh, an ambient temperature in here, between 14 and 16 degrees centigrade. Right. Regularly. It doesn't matter what time of year it is. Right. It covers missing the drains going across oh, okay. the tunnel. So, if you see what looks like deep water, just be... It might be. <laughs> so, what are these little sort of... Um, uh, wrecking tools for track maintenance, etc. So, when they repair the track and the train is coming, they'll jump into them for safety. But there's all this water coming in, wouldn't that be an issue? I mean, could you, would you have to stop that or...? Yes. Um, we've designed the system to stop it called the Hopper and Pipe. We've been to another town out to see where the water was worse than this. They put the Hopper and Pipes in, the water's gone. Has it? Yeah. Right. So it's not a difficult thing to fix? Very easy to do, actually. You can see here is an arch section. They put this up, or these arches, and the cover boards simply because there's a little bit of spalling or breakage from the ceiling, from the roof. It's only superficial, but it does keep falling down. And what we can do is here, those are actually railway tracks. Oh, they? They bend into shape. <laughs> this is the worst part of the tunnel, in effect. The old railway slippers. Yes. So what, they just stripped out everything, did they? All the, well, all obviously the track the rails. and the yes, rails. The the sleepers, but they did use a, a load of sleepers to build a cog, which we'll see as we go in. Right. Now this looks very untidy, but it's really nothing to uh, to resolve and no. make it nice and smooth and have a track. Right. That's going to be twenty point six. Everything else zero. So what's this monitoring? This monitors five gases: oxygen, methane, hydrogen sulfide. Carbon monoxide and something called volatile organic compounds. For right. A word. I've seen those on paints. That's right. Now, why we want to, the local authority wants to monitor them here, we don't know why, because there's a greater reading for volatile organic compounds on the surface than what there is down here. <laughs> but in general, the air quality is pretty good, right? It's fabulous, it's fine. Now, this is a bit unique, this tunnel, as a mining person. I'm used to this term, because we used to use it underground, watch the pipe. It's called a cross-measure drift in effect. Now underground, if we used to drive a tunnel like this, we'd call it a cross-measure drift. Why? Because it crosses coal measures. Oh. Cross-measure. It crosses two measures at coal, and therefore, um, there was coal seams work below us from collieries, and above us from shallow mines, what we call adits. So therefore, we do need to, to sample and monitor for methane. Right. But of course, it's like 60, 70 years or even more since the coal was worked beneath us. And therefore, it's unlikely you now to have any gases migrating up into the tunnel. And things like radon you, that might be a concern, we, but there isn't any. We are starting to sample for radon daughters, radon gas, in the new year. We're going to put some monitors in, four monitors in, uh, equally spaced, and we monitor them every three months. This area is uh, an intermediate area for rain on gas. Down south is very high, the further north you go is a little bit less. What's the plan for what you'd put in here? Initially the plan was to have a drainage this side and a drainage that side. The main drain is this side, the right hand side as we walk in here. Yeah. So all this will be renewed, the drainage. We will have a drainage channel this side as well. 
and we'll have at least nine feet of a tarmac path going across. And so what would that allow in terms of it bikes will allow and people? Two-way traffic for cycles and two-way for pedestrians, although the pedestrian can be quite close. We will need to separate the cycle a little bit, obviously, for safety. And that should work quite easily. It's been proven to work in the bath tunnels. Right. But the time seems like it's right, doesn't it? With the, you know, with the bike park Wales opening and the Affa Valley, um, you know, bike park, and, and just a general interest in mountain biking. It seems, you know, amongst everything else, and the whole opening up of tourism in this area, it does seem like the time is right. Yes, it is. There's no doubt about, about uh, at all. There's no doubt about the timing. The fact remains that the Avon Valley that we are walking towards now has over 200 kilometres of mountain bike trail just two miles from this tunnel. You can ride for 12 miles from the portal down to Tal Port Talbot without touching a main road. <laughs> and the houses over here that are, a lot of people have bought houses this end simply to rent out to mountain bikers and they rent it out 50 weeks of the year. Wow. The potential is enormous. Yeah. We are now at what we call P Mark 360. So we have just come about 60, 60 meters, 70 meters or so. Underneath the deepest part of the tunnel, there's a thousand feet of pen and sandstone above us. Wow. And that is for the majority of the length of the tunnel. <laughs> How long did it take to build it? Well, six years. Five, six years? Six years. There were six men killed during its construction. And the society have actually had pens made from the track keys. We've taken them up and cleaned them. And uh, we've had fountain pens, biros, etc. made from the track keys. Oh, wow. And we've named each one after the men that were killed. Aww. Here's an example of the spray concrete I was telling you about. Oh, yeah. Very early spray concrete. These were put there because the, the um, director of the railways at the time came in here and he saw pure sandstone and he said, aesthetically, that's not pleasing. I need you to tidy it up to look better. <laughs> and that's what they did. We are now coming into the brick line section. We've just passed the masonry section. And what they did, as they were taking the sandstone out, they were dressing it and using it to build the tunnel, to line the tunnel. Oh, wow. So it was very little waste. It works oh. a magnetic resonance thing. Tunnel party to the flight controller, over. <laughs> mm. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. We are now at... 1,000 meters. 1,000 1, meters and all is good, over. Roger, I'll speak to you at 11 o'clock. Roger, I know. Thank you. So how does that work? Stay there, mate. You were, um, this, you were in contact with this. You've got to, as long as the loop is inside the magnetic um, part of the handset, then it'll transmit. If we kept the set on and we had it connected to that moving along, he could get in touch with us all the time whenever we wanted to. But unless we connected it, the surface can't get in touch with us. What's this? It's a fold. A fold. See a fold coming around. A little bit of a fracture line. You see that doesn't quite meet up there. So is that good or bad? It's bad, in effect, because it's a friable part of the tunnel. Um, and there's more likely to be falls in this area when you're driving it. And it's a bit more difficult to secure as well when you're building around it. But pretty competent. And it's made of? Sandstone. Sandstone, but not the soft sandstone I know. Sandstone generally can range between 25,000 and 35,000 pounds per square inch compressive strength. What's above us is roughly that. It's quite strong. So what are your impressions, first impressions of the tunnel then? Um, generally extremely good, far better than I thought it would be. 
Um, <coughs> clearly, there's the sections where the rails are, and there's been some erosion there. Sprayed concrete will sort that out very easily. Um, I'm just interested to see where the fault is at the cog and how that is, because that's what closed the tunnel. Right. And you're going to be very um, supportive of this project, which is amazing. What do you think it's going to take to make it happen? Because um, well, you're, you're being generous, but it needs more money, doesn't it? It needs a lot more money than we can afford to, to put in. But, we're, but what you're putting in is vital. Uh, yeah, well, what we're hoping to do is to make a contribution to funding the opening up of the Blind Gwindia. Um, and that may involve drilling a new tunnel rather than just digging it out. Um, they're looking at the economics of that. But either way, we've offered them a couple of hundred thousand wow. um, towards doing that. I think it's probably about a million pounds worth of work. So, But this usual thing, if, 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 if other people see that people are committed to it to the tune of an in, you know, not an insignificant amount of money, it, it gives confidence to other potential funders, doesn't it? A absolutely. I think somebody said from Balfour Beat is 95% of the tunnel is brilliant, which it is. Um, there are bits that need work doing on it, but it's all doable, and I've done similar jobs in the past, so I've got no concern about that. Um, and the cog, which is what clo closed the line, is, is stable and not a problem. So it's doable. We've done others, and there's no reason at all why we shouldn't do this one. And why should you do this one? All the reasons that Steve has said. It's, it joins the Ronda to the Avon Valley. It tracks people here. I'm tied up with the Welsh Highland Railway up in North Wales, and we've done an academic study on what that's brought to the area. And that railway has, for an expenditure of 17 million pounds, has brought in about 15 million a year. So if you get it right, it's really worth it. And first minister actually said the Welsh Highland is his best investment ever. Well, let's see if we can top it with this one. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the practicalities of getting it open, do you see anything that you, you're obviously highly experienced yeah, in this field? Anything that you see that worries you? Or No, it's um, digging out the cuttings is, is it's big, but it's a doddle at this end. It's slightly more complex at the other end because of the houses, but there's some interesting ideas about drilling a, a short tunnel to extend the length of it at that end. Um, there's nothing in engineering terms that is any difficulty at all in it. And what does it feel like for you going down? Well, it's, in one sense, it's another tunnel. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of my life going into tunnels, both operational and non-operational, so it's not the excitement of a, a completely new experience. But I was area civil engineer covering up to Treherbert in 1979. I knew about it then. I've known about it ever since 1979. I've always thought it would be nice to do something with it, and I'm now in a position to help do something with it, and I'm delighted with what Steve and the team are doing, and and very much want to be part of it. No, oh, brilliant. Here we have the course scene, which are all going straight to work. Oh, you can see it clearly here, and they've put, you can see the supports they've put up. Oh, my word. And there's a full, almost a full course scene, which is dipping. So it's obviously a bit oh, of a full thing around here. Just as a matter of interest, if everybody puts their lights off for a moment, this is the light they would have had years ago when they drove the tunnel initially. Uh -huh. Maybe they could turn the flame up a bit more than this and give a little bit more illumination, but that is very often what people used to work by. They used to have carbide lights. The reason I brought this lamp today, because we're at the coal sea wheel, and as I mentioned earlier on, it's what we call a cross-measure drift, in effect. And this stick is the originally called the yardstick. This is where the yardstick name came from because it measures a yard. And officials underground, that's how we used to measure how much coal a man had shifted and pay him. So they put it down like that, one yard, two yards, by one yard, that's how much they're getting paid today. And it had a dual function as well, besides hitting men as well to get on with the work. <laughs> Where you couldn't reach the sump for gas, they would put this on the end of the stick because there's a brass ferrule on the end. That would be compressed, to get the air out, so that it'll be flat. And if they put it up against the roof, it would operate this valve, so the bulb would then inflate and take a sample of the air, which was above you, which you couldn't reach. He then take the valve off. This is where we need to turn our lights off, isn't it? Turn and put it into this lamp here, like so. And if you turn your lights off, I'm gonna aspirate, and you should see the flame on here flattening out a little bit. 
which would show us the percentage of gas that they found. See the flame flattening out a little? And back up a little bit. That shows me, but there, there's probably about 1% of gas. Now, that's the reason, because what I did this morning is put this up against my gas stove, <laughs> deflated it, and let it take a little sample in. And that was an official way of reading for gas underground. You were taught the size of the flame would show you the percentage of gas. Now, if that flame had gone up about a half an inch or maybe an inch, there'd probably be about 4 to 5% of gas there. And that is significant because methane, the explosive range of methane is between 5.4 and 14.8%, with 9.5% being its most explosive part. So that's all you need in methane. When you turn your gas stove on, if you try to put a, a flame into your gas pipe, the flame will just go out. Because it's 100% gas, you can't burn, there's no oxygen. When you turn your gas stove on, gas comes out and mixes with air and ignites. That's how you burn your stove and cook your food. So there's only a small percentage of gas coming out in your gas stove. That's six, six, so that percentage is between 5.4 and 40.8. That's why it's burning. It's exploding, in effect. Right. And that's what used to happen. There's a, there's a, a mine just down the Rhone Valley called the Cambrian in 1965, where 31 men got killed with uh, uh, an explosion of methane. And they reckon there was about 9% of methane mixture in the air. Only 9%. Wow. And it blew people to bits, decapitated them a lot. Mm. So that is why we, we have to sample for every other gas, hydrogen sulfide, um, CO, and methane when we are down here. It is clear. This is a Ronda number two seam, not a particularly gaseous seam, bituminous coal used for steam, generating steam more than anything else. They also use it on their fires. There's a high uh, percentage ash in this. So the power stations used to, like, used to like this because it wouldn't burn too hot in their, uh, in their burners. Halfway through the tunnel about now, and there's this huge great construction, they call it the cog. It's, it's supporting, uh, well, theoretically something going uh, on the roof, but uh, in fact it isn't touching the roof. So, um, in general, the condition of the tunnel is amazing. I mean, considering, how old is it now? It was built in 1885. 1885, you know, the Victorians knew what they were doing. Uh, and the reality is, to get it into a usable state, it's not, well, it's going to take a bit of money, but, um, you know, the main structure is, is, is pretty good. Well. <laughs> Explain to me in basic details what it links to, what it, what, where it goes from and to. Okay, they built the tunnel in 1885. It took five years to build. They opened it in 1890. That was before man could fly. Um, so it's been there all this time and it's in a remarkable condition. It was put there to transport coal from the Rhondda Valley up to uh, Port Talbot and Swansea Bay to ship all around the world because it was the best steam coal in the world then and still is now. And so it links, I mean, to do it by other means, if it wasn't for the tunnel, what's the journey in terms of miles and what, compared to what the tunnel is? If you left the Rhondda Valley now and had to go over the Bulch Mountain Road to Swansea, it would probably take you about, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour. Um, whereas in this situation with the tunnel open, you could cycle through in 20 minutes and you're nearly there. <laughs> it's amazing. So what's the hurdles to getting it opened? Um, the big hurdle is, of course, ownership and money. Uh, we're not particularly worried about money because we're getting promises of money um, left, right and centre, basically. And with RCT now, um, which That's is Rhonda Borough Council, yeah. um, they are applying for uh, a grant from the, the, the lottery, the National Lottery. And um, fingers crossed we'll get that. So, Martin, no, I can probably ask you on the surface. But sorry, so what's standing in the way of this opening then? Right, it's owned by the Westminster government. Um, they're not allowed to reopen it because of the rules under which it's, they, they're, they're responsible for it. They want to give it to the Welsh Government with £60,000, which will be the money they don't have to spend on it to inspect it. The Welsh Government needs, wants and needs, well, several millions. And Chris Bryant, who's the local MP, is approaching Grant Chaps's department 
to basically to get some more money from him. We're pretty confident they will do that, given the sort of things that this tunnel can do when it's been reopened. Um, and it, we need what we need to do is make it so that people will really want to come here. It's taken us an hour and 20 minutes to walk this far. We're not to the far end yet. We need to put things in the tunnel to really interest people. And it's the middle of the tunnel, it's dry and warm, and it's sort of ideal for putting all sorts of exhibits in that are going to interest people of all ages. So we're really looking for ideas on what we can put in. Can you estimate how much money it could potentially bring in in terms of tourism to the area? Uh, yeah, we did have a few uh, estimates and it could probably bring in around 40 million within the next 15 years. Right. So how confident are you to be able to how long will it be before it's open, do you think? We estimated when we started around 10 to 12 years. We've been at it now seven years. So within the next three, I've got my fingers crossed. Yes, certainly. <laughs> and why do you love it so much? Um, I used to play in the tunnel when I was 10. Um, I, in fact, I had a nickname, uh, which was the boy in the dark. I was in there so often. <laughs> um, I spent my lifetime in there and I, I loved it. Um, I was dangled over the portal here in Blancombe by two 10 year old boys. I painted the stone white, put my name on it and said, please open me. And here we are today now, uh, nearly there. <laughs> well, good luck. This, this is a distant signal, which warns the train crew what the signals at Blind Gwynville are. So that is the pivot that the signal was on. That's probably the remnants of the signal arm. This shelf here is where the lamp was, because obviously the driver would not have been able to see the arm of the signal. So the signal had a red and yellow light in it, sorry, a green and yellow light in it. And he would, depending on where the signal was, you'd see the green or the yellow. And Great Western Railway signals were a danger like that and a clear like that. So to fail safe, uh -huh. you had to have a counterbalance weight that would pull it back upright uh, if the signal failed. And that's a counterbalance weight. Oh, oh, it's lovely. You've told us all about this then, because we always thought it was a gong. No. Yeah. And then that there is a control wire from the signal box that came onto that loop and around the pivot there and away. So this is it. This is the other end. How far have we walked then? Well, if you want to go around there and look through the hall, that's a chamber we drained, and you could see where the material was infilled from the blind wind the end. This is the 8 inch hole we drilled yep. to drain the lake, as we call it, which is acting superbly. Um, and that's the smallest bore that we've seen since we drilled the hole, which is good news. Yeah. What are we looking at? What is this? This is backfill. 25 metres down there is the portal, the opening. Yeah? And they backfill it with a bulldozer. It was only supposed to be backfilled up to 5 metres. But they backfilled it 25 metres. And there's a drain down here, a new drain was put in. And we think that drain is not working because this backfill is blocked it. Hence the flooding. That's why we drilled the hole. So you'd have to take all this out, obviously. Yes. What can people do to help? Um, to help join the society. Uh, every penny that we have in helps us move forward uh, with the project. Um, and and that's, that's all there is to it. We don't ask you to come out to cut trees, mow grass, dig trenches. All we need is your, your support and your membership, which is £10 a year. And children under 16 go free. <laughs> so, <clears throat> 3,000 metres. Uh, 3,300 feet and we reach the other end of the tunnel which as you can see has been blocked in like uh, the other end. Um, it's taken them, I don't know, an hour and a half or so to walk this far um, to cycle it, it'll probably take 20 minutes or something but to drive it this is the equivalent distance um, I reckon that a car could set off from the other end of that tunnel and drive the long way down the valleys along the M4 to Port Talbot. And I reckon a bike going pretty, you know, reasonable speed could do it in the same amount of time. Bush bike. But it's just what it does in terms of opening up the tourism in the Rhonda Valleys, the Affen Valley, and uh, just opens up this route so you could cycle all the way from 
Swansea, Port Talbot, all the way through to the Rhondda Valley and, uh, and everything that's there. So, I mean, it is going to happen. It's got to happen. As a project, it's extraordinary. It's just when. I guess that just comes down to money. But it certainly came down to enthusiasm and commitment, <laughs> as you can see, uh, from the members of the society, uh, the Rhondda Tunnel Society. Uh, it would, uh, based on their enthusiasm, it would happen tomorrow. Uh, I think if you can check out the Rhondda Tunnel Society and uh, the project, help in any way you can, I'm sure they'd appreciate it. <laughs> Amazing. What we're going to do now is walk uh, two miles back. Mm -hmm.